things that we've all been sitting in this courthouse. This is all a Biden indictment. It's in order to try and win an election, political opponent, and nothing like this has ever happened. Eight days. As you know, the economy is falling apart now. Now you're seeing it very little growth. It's going to get worse. Oil prices are going up. You have the college campuses all over closed down. Our country is going to hell. And we sit here day after day after day, which is their plan. They think they might be able to eke out an election, but I doubt it because the poll numbers are very good for us. I just want to say that I've been invited Biden to debate. He can do it any time he wants, including tonight. I'm ready. Here we are. I invited him to the courthouse that he has us tied up in his administration. This is all being done through Washington. It's all a well coordinated attack on a political opponent. But I'm here. I'm ready, willing, and able. And if he wants, I'll do it on Monday night, Tuesday night, or Wednesday night. We'll be in Michigan, the state that he's destroyed because of the auto industry. We're not going to have any jobs left in Michigan. No auto jobs left in Michigan. We're all going over to China and other places with this ridiculous EV mandate, electric vehicle mandate. But we're willing to do it Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, or Friday night on national television. We're ready. Just tell me where. Uh, we'll do it in the White House. That would be very comfortable, actually. But if you tell me where, but we're ready. He's obviously not showing up now. We heard nothing. But he said today that, oh, I'd love to debate, but he won't debate. I don't think he'll debate. Maybe he will. Maybe he will. I'm not sure he has a choice. But that's the story. So here we are. We're ready, willing, and able. And uh, we don't see him, and I don't think he'll be here. But maybe next week he'll do it. I doubt it, but maybe next week. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. I know you have to suffer through this like everybody else. Uh, nothing has come. This is a case that should have never been brought. Every legal scholar, every legal expert, Andy McCarthy, uh, Jonathan, Andy, every single one, Jonathan Turley, who came out with a scathing report of this trial today. Andy McCarthy, scathing report. Uh, Mark Levin, can't believe this is happening in our country. There's no case here. There's no case whatsoever. It's a disgrace. We have a conflicted judge, and it shouldn't be happening. Not in this country. Thank you very much. Do you think you'd be fine for me? Thank you, President Donald Trump. And I support you totally. And we need to straighten up our justice system for correct and honest cases. One of the legal experts he just cited is with us, Jonathan Turley. Your reaction to what you heard? Well, he cited Annie McCarthy first. Uh, so, uh, 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 with, with, with some sense of open bitterness, I, the, no, I, the, the 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 problem is that we've just finished this week of of testimony, and so far it's been a slurpy trial. You know, it's all rush, no nutrition. I mean, it, you you sort of look at this, and you know, what did we actually gain? from these witnesses. And usually, I'm speaking as a criminal defense attorney, you expect the lead witness to really set the table for the jury. But you know, in, in both relationships and trials, first impressions matter. What's the first impression here? They've been talking about something not in the indictment, something that's not a crime, and actually their star lead witness seem to help the president by saying that he denied knowledge of reimbursements to Michael Cohen uh, and that he did this for other celebrities and he did this for Trump going back two decades. So you were left on Friday wondering what's the intelligent design here towards conviction and one thing that would help if you would just tell us what's the crime? Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, they haven't gotten to that part yet. Um, I Sort of looking back at what he said, he walked out and one of his first words was, this should not be happening, this should have never happened. He said he's been sitting there for eight days. Uh, he launched into uh, the happenings with the economy, which he's quite clearly still uh, watching as he sits in that courtroom. Uh, oil prices up, he said the economy is falling apart, his words. But he says he sits there day after day and he just heard that uh, 
President Biden has agreed to debate, uh, which was in an interview with Howard Stern today, a bit of a shocker because the indication was that he was not going to debate. The president then extended an invitation as soon as next week. Let's do this. We're ready, willing, and able. Uh, he suggested next week in Michigan. Um, he then launched into what he said was a well-coordinated attack on a political opponent, Tom. Your reaction to the former president's words? How quickly he transitioned from criticizing the trial to immediately going into campaign mode. I love the fact that he picked up President Biden's challenge, or at least his apparent offer to debate him. I love the fact that Trump proposed the debate happened at the White House. <laughs> so I think the president or the former president is showing that he can actually function effectively, notwithstanding the fact that he does have to spend a lot of his days in a cold courtroom in New York City. He's coming out. He's clearly comfortable addressing the public. He's clearly comfortable transitioning away away from the criminal proceeding into the political issues. He's a leader. The gauntlet that Biden threw down and accepting the debate challenge. And I think we're going to continue to see this as the weeks move ahead in this trial. Yeah, Phil, I think his exact words were, how about the White House? That would be comfortable. All right, is Phil still with us? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was for me. I apologize. Yeah, look, I'm still, I apologize. Look, you need not look any further than the fact that this trial is happening right now uh, in the middle of the campaign. And as the uh, parties get ready to nominate uh, their nominees this summer, that fact alone shows that this is a political show trial. And the fact that we are not seeing any real hard evidence of criminality is not surprising because, look, any prosecutor that would cobble together this ridiculous indictment that takes a an expired case, a misdemeanor that's expired by the statute of limitations and tries to bootstrap it into 30-something felonies by tying it to another misdemeanor uh, that really can't be proven either based on the evidence we heard from Mr. Packer, all that put together shows you that Donald Trump is correct in everything that he said, criticizing the judge and criticizing this trial. And honestly, this is a situation where the historians of the future are going to look back, and I'm afraid they're not going to be able to have any confidence in the outcome of this case, particularly if there's a conviction. Yeah, if anybody who's just tuning in now or listening, uh, the former president just departed the courthouse, uh, slammed the most uh, ridiculous trial, trial that I've ever seen. Happening. Totally ridiculous. Uh, Shameful. Okay. So on the part of the judge and the prosecutors. And spoke to cameras just a moment ago. So we'll All politics, part, dirty politics. Uh, departure from the courthouse. Shameful politics. Um, out to the street level, I believe we did catch that yesterday, so we're keeping our eye on that. Jonathan, uh, move this forward to us. I believe uh, what they have already said is that there will not be a day of trial on the tw April 29th or on Wednesdays. I guess that leaves us that next Tuesday this will resume. Um, what? What, do you, what is your understanding as to where this goes next? Well, they're obviously laying a lot of foundation in these last couple of witnesses. The uh, question is, are they going to call McDougal? I don't see why they would, because her relationship is really not that material. Uh, it's even to the sort of secondary arguments they seem to be making with regard to Pecker. So all of us are really looking at when they're going to bring out uh, Michael Cohen, because he's obviously, and is becoming more obvious by the day, uh, the key linchpin to Trump. He's the one who's uh, going to be sort of filling in those details. Uh, he's going to be on the stand for a number of days. We don't know when that's going to happen. I would think they would try to put that in the middle of the trial, because he's such a high-risk, combustible witness. I sure the heck wouldn't want to finish with him, because if things go badly, uh, you don't want that to be the last major thing the jury sees. You want to give yourself a little bit of runway in case you have to take off again. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll have to see. But, you know, Bragg is not informing the defense with any real uh, notice beyond a day or so of, of the witness order. So we have to wait, as does the defense. Uh, we were, thank you very much to all three of you. Uh, really great to have you as we were able to catch the president there live. Um, thank you very much. Jonathan, always first in our book.
<laughs> Good stuff. All right, looking at Emory University in Atlanta, we are monitoring anti-Israel protests on that campus there. And as the protests continue to ramp up, so are economic worries for President Biden and legal troubles for former President Donald Trump. So how is it all playing out politically? Terrible to see these organized reactions to Israel. Terrible. Terrible. Freetrunkguide.com. My back got injured very bad. I was off work for about a year. I heard about a relief factor from my wife. I took it every day, three times a day, for three weeks. I looked at her and I said, the pain is gone. And she said, I'm glad it helped. I said, no, you don't understand. It's gone. You it's gone. It's gone. With the pain, the pain in my tooth is gone. It's gone. The pain in my tooth from that voracious ball in the house here. The tooth was so painful, but it's gone. It's gone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, or this was from earlier, I should say, at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, we are monitoring anti-Israel protests like this that are popping up on college campuses coast to coast. Uh, it was a raucous day there on Thursday. Um, Jonathan Sari is on the campus and he joins us with the very latest. Looks a little different today. Yeah, very different. Sandra here at my alma mater. Uh, several hundred protesters have returned to the quad, but so far things here are peaceful. Several dozen pro protesters marched to the administration building where they hand delivered a list of demands that the university order police agencies off campus, that they work to free incarcerated protesters, and that they grant amnesty to student protesters. Several dozen demonstrators also have been camping out in the lobby of the theology center school some of them actually sleeping there overnight they sang they prayed and they listened to anyone who wanted to speak including this Palestinian student take a listen this is the most support I've ever seen I'm ashamed to say before coming to Emory I had started to lose hope but I'm finding my voice again it's sad to say it's taken this much violence to get here most undergraduate classes were held virtually today. This comes after yesterday's events in which police arrested 28 protesters who allegedly pushed past officers and set up tents on the campus quadrangle where the university is preparing for its May commencement activities. According to university officials, objects were thrown at police and one protester from outside the Emory community was tased after allegedly attacking an officer. University officials say 20 of the 28 protesters arrested have ties to Emory and the university is working to expedite the release of any who remain in custody. Today the university president issued a statement saying that Emory will work to uh, facilitate the free flow of peaceful ideas. However, uh, the university president said the, that Emory will not tolerate any violence or vandalism. Sandra? Uh, Jonathan Seri with the latest right. on Emory about time. in Atlanta for Peaceful you. is understandable. GOP lawmakers are At least the understandable. Now from Violence is not understandable. Our next guest is one of them. Uh, let's ask uh, House Oversight Member and South Carolina Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Safe to say you are? Oh, absolutely. Anti-Semitism should not be funded with American tax dollars. And if that is a way to incentivize uh, folks to behave better, to allow Jewish students to go to class. We have Jewish students on Ivy League campuses today that can't go to class. Uh, we just heard from Jonathan Siri that at Emory University in Atlanta, they did virtual school today. Um, this isn't the kind of environment that's healthy for students, and if it means that we pull federal funding so that we're not funding with taxpayer dollars to anti-Semitism on campuses, so be it. You've got classes getting canceled, you've got graduation ceremonies mm -hmm. being nixed. I mean, this is just a mess. Um, I mean, did you ever imagine that you would see uh, people on college campuses, I mean, sometimes they're students, sometimes they're not, but, but chanting support for terrorist groups? Right, and we've all seen the images of the flag of Hezbollah 
being flown yeah. by many of these misguided students. I mean, Hezbollah has murdered Americans, murdered American soldiers. These people, I mean, if you love Hezbollah so much, go to Gaza. Go see what that's like, because I guarantee you, these soy latte drinking Ivy League students wouldn't last a minute in Gaza. They wouldn't that's last right. anywhere at the Shameful. center because my alma mater would not put up with the kind of behavior that we're seeing today. Shameful. So, the tax I mean, on I Israel, shameful. The federal funding, but there's something bigger happening here, right? I mean, is, is that really well, this is big money to organized to the bottom of what's happening in this country? The China. I don't, I don't think and so. Iran. I never imagined. I come from Charleston, South Carolina. We have one of the most historic Jewish communities in the country. And we have uh, Jewish folks, Jewish community members that are fearful to walk out of their house. They fear going to class. They fear going to work. I never imagined in my lifetime in 2024 that anyone would be attacked because of their faith, particularly a, a community that has been attacked for so many years, uh, going back to obviously World War II, everything that they've come from. And this is where we are today. It's culturally, it's a major, major issue. And I honestly, I'm a parent of two teenage kids. I don't know how we got here. I don't know how this is happening in this country um, that we are antagonizing and attacking people because of their faith, because they're Jewish. Yeah, and considering what you just said, lifetime. so many people listening at home uh, may be in the same position. I have mm -hmm. teenage kids at home, they're looking at colleges, and they're wondering, yeah. what is the future of our colleges and universities in this country? A final thought from you. Well, I, I, we're looking at colleges with my kids right now, and I will tell you the ones that will be most successful coming out of this thing will be the ones that tamp down on bigotry. Bigotry includes anti-Semitism. And uh, I know that I, that absolutely South, right. be South Carolina, they're not going to put up with this. It would not be tolerated. Hate All of this, thanks to and those are the President of Joe Biden and Barack and Obama. That That's where like this, this stems uh, from, totally. As they watch these, um, we need to re-elect Donald Trump a leader. Thank you mm -hmm. for joining with godly principles. Thank you. All right. Well, the political fallout from the presumptive presidential nominees from a week that gave us trials, protests, and price hikes that are not cooling down. Welcome to Washington. I'm Mike Emanuel and for Brett there. Escalating confrontations with police by anti-Israel protesters are now threatening college graduation activities in some locations. Former President Trump again insists the criminal proceedings against him in New York are all about politics. And the shock and they are. of how a school principal was framed by artificial intelligence. <laughs> president Biden says he would be happy to debate former President Trump. The president made the comment on a day he spent time in New York, but stayed away from any of the anti-Israel protests. Correspondent Mark Meredith is at the White House tonight. Good evening, Mark. Mike, good evening to you. President Biden still faces a lot of questions about his age, his mental abilities, whether or not he's up for the job for another four years. But tonight, as you mentioned, he's making news by saying he is ready to hit the debate stage. This fall, voters can expect a sequel. President Biden says he will get on the debate stage to face former President Trump before the election. Biden making the news while speaking with shock jock Howard Stern. I don't know if you're going to debate your... Uh your opponent. I am somewhere. I don't know where. And I'm, I'm happy. I know. Until now, Biden and his campaign had stopped short of agreeing to any kind of debate with Trump. Last month, Biden himself claimed there would have to be conditions. Will you commit to a debate with former President Trump? It depends on his behavior. Trump says he's ready to debate tonight. <laughs> depends upon his behavior. He's the problem. He's the guy that's got the behavioral problem. Donald Biden's Trump's ready. comes amid new polling, showing the president's re-election is far from certain. Gallup writing, quote, with about six months remaining before election day, Biden stands in a weaker position than any prior incumbent. That's right. Recent pro-Palestinian protests on college campuses are also raising questions about potential divides among Democrats this fall. While in New York the past two days, Biden avoided high-profile protests at Columbia University, instead spending time with celebrities at a campaign fundraiser. President Biden is likely to have a lot to say about his predecessor and the state of politics when he addresses the annual correspondence dinner tomorrow night. But it's possible, Mike, a pro-Palestinian protest may also steal some of the spotlight. They're scheduled to demonstrate pretty close to the Hilton, where both the press and the president will be. Mike, Mark Meredith live on the North Lawn. Mark.
Thanks very much. In several cities, the demonstrations are causing some administrators to reconsider their traditional spring activities. Correspondent Steve Harrigan is on the Columbia campus tonight. Good evening, Steve. Mike, Columbia wants to clear these tents before graduation, but there's no sign that's going to happen. Free, free, free University officials across the country are racing to figure out graduation plans. These fast moving protests at some of the nation's top schools show no signs of stopping. We remain diligent and steadfast in our convictions. It will not be intimidated by the university's disturbing threat to our lives. In New York, Columbia University says there's no new deadline for protesters to leave. After the latest one expired at midnight, the tents remain up. As the school says, talks about protester demands for divesting and amnesty for those disciplined are progressing and claim they will not call in the New York Police Department. In Washington, D.C., Jewish students at George Washington University expressed fear during a second day of protests. This is a very scary time to be living uh, as a Jewish university student on any campus anywhere. We're afraid for our safety. Fox's Griff Jenkins is on campus. Student protesters continue to occupy the university yard here at GW behind me, defying an order to vacate last night. So far, we've not seen the violent encounters like another protest, but Jewish students, like the one you just heard from, say they feel threatened by the rhetoric and signs like this one that reads Final Solution next to an Israeli flag. The university has warned students who remain in the yard they may be temporarily suspended. In Georgia... Classes went virtual at Emory University after chaotic and violent scenes yesterday. Fox's Jonathan Seri is in Atlanta. The decision to move classes online came out of an abundance of caution after yesterday's heated protests in which 28 people were arrested. Protesters did return to the campus quad this afternoon, but so far the demonstrations have been peaceful. With hundreds of arrests nationwide, classes coming to a halt, and students and teachers feeling threatened. Former Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg says it's time for honest conversations. University is a time where you can talk about any issue, open dialogue. But when you see students yelling at the Columbia campus to a Jewish student, go back to Poland. When you see someone saying October 7th is going to happen to you, that's not okay. The University of Florida has a clear message for its students try and set up a tent on campus and face a three-year suspension. Mike? Steve Harrigan, live in New York City. Steve, thanks a lot. We've just right. concluded the first full week of testimony in the historic criminal trial of former President Trump. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee insists the proceedings are all about politics. Correspondent Nathan And they Boyd are. Is that is York. all politics. The state's newest witness, Gary Farrow, testified today. Former President Donald Trump's old lawyer, Michael Cohen, tried opening a bank account under the name Resolution Consultants, LLC. That's the same account that former American media CEO and president David Pecker testified Cohen nearly used to reimburse him for purchasing the lifetime rights to former Playboy model Karen McDougal's story about an alleged affair with Trump, who said again tonight this trial is politically motivated. We sit here day after day after day, which is their plan, because they think they might be able to eke out an election. Today, Pecker wrapped up his testimony, telling the court, quote, I have been truthful to the best of my recollection. Former President Trump's lawyers exposed inconsistencies with Pecker's testimony about whether or not Trump thanked him for suppressing stories. Pecker says he now believes he violated federal election law while suppressing McDougal's story. Trump's longtime executive, Ronna Graff, also took the stand today, describing the former president as a fair and respectful boss for 34 years. Graff maintained Trump's contacts, including those of McDougal and adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Graff testified she vaguely remembers seeing Daniels at Trump Tower before the 2016 election. Court is not in session on Monday, so the trial will resume on Tuesday of next week. But before that, former President Donald Trump will be headed back to Florida to celebrate former First Lady Melania Trump's birthday. Mike? They boy live in New York City. Nate, Happy birthday to Melania, a Stocks wonderful, the wonderful first lady the S &P and wife ahead 52. NASDAQ surged and mother. 16. For the week, the Dow was up two-thirds of a percentage point. The S&P 500 gained two and two-thirds. NASDAQ jumped four and a quarter.
House Republicans are going after President Biden over his refusal to extend tax cuts championed by former President Trump. GOP lawmakers are forming teams to address the impact of losing those breaks. Here is Fox Business correspondent Grady Trimble. At stake in the November election, your tax dollars, with some provisions in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act set to expire at the end of next year, House Republicans say they should stay in place. It's critical because what we're telling people is you get to keep more of your own money to invest in the way you think it's best for you, your family, your, your, and your country. Tax Subcommittee Chair Mike Kelly and Ways and Means Committee Chair Jason Smith are creating 10 tax teams to take a look at the impact of the cuts ending, with groups of lawmakers focusing on manufacturing, Main Street and rural America, supply chains, and more. An analysis from the Tax Foundation finds if the cuts expire, some middle-class families would have to pay between $1,600 and around $7,500 more in taxes each year. A worrying thought when high prices are already stretching budgets thin. President Biden says if he's re-elected, he'll kill the Trump-era tax cuts. It's going to expire and dead forever if I'm elected. Seemingly contradicting his campaign promise not to raise taxes on those making under $400,000 a year. But the administration is clarifying the president does not want to raise taxes on middle-class Americans. The president will not raise taxes on people who make under $40,000. He's going to make sure that we increase taxes modestly on the wealthy and also on corporations. The 2017 tax cuts permanently lowered the corporate tax rate to 21 percent. President Biden wants to bump it up to 28 percent, along with a slew of other tax hikes that he says will get the wealthiest Americans and big companies to pay their fair share. Republicans argue they'll have negative consequences for everyday Americans, too. Mike. Grady Trimble, thanks so much. Up next, we will check in with the Fox Weather Center about some severe weather going on right now. For an hour and a half, and eventually became a massive wedge tornado around 40 to 50 miles to the west of Omaha, cutting just towards those net northwestern towns of the Omaha area. Behind that, there have been more tornado warning storms, and we are right now currently have some really significant weather cutting right across the Missouri River from Nebraska in towards areas of Iowa. So that's going to be our focus for the next couple of hours. You see these tornado warned storms in Iowa right now get down towards Kansas. We'll see this across parts of Oklahoma. And we pray they don't and head towards, towards Kentucky. Tornado watches all up and down Tornado Alley here for the next number of hours. This is what Nebraska has looked like. We've had tornadoes that have been confirmed around the Columbus area over towards Schuyler. Then we've had them down towards the Lincoln area. This is that one that became that massive wedge tornado that's now stretching in across parts of Iowa. You see these tornado warm storms here. If you're anywhere along that uh, Missouri River area right now, be very careful, especially headed in towards Iowa. This is tonight the tornado threat. We're going to continue to see this. And I will tell you, Mike, this is going to be with us all the way through Sunday. This was today. Uh, it it might be. Down in that uh, all of this going tomorrow, tomorrow, far western and Kentucky a area, just a short little today. ways away. If you hear, are here across the plains, you've got to watch out tonight and throughout much of this weekend for this severe weather that is coming your way. Mike? Rick Reckmuth, thank you.